Uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's session for the architecture conversations. Tonight, we have two architects um, who don't necessarily fit the profile of many leading architects in Singapore. Both are young and have established themselves with a series of notable projects while still in their 30s. And both clearly, I hope you've noticed, are, are female. Um, in fact, they're the only two women who are part of our lecture series this term. Um, architecture is often called, in the language of the last century, an old man's profession. Um, in this context, though, Christina and Xing represent, um, what do they represent? They represent young women who have broken a very long-standing mold to give new voices to practice. And while we don't want to reduce this to a conversation about gender or reduce their works um, to be representative of any female approach to architecture, this is a very interesting fact, nonetheless, uh, and perhaps we can explore this a little bit with them both in our discussion or Q&A later. We won't make it the main subject, though. Okay. Um, regardless of gender, however, our speak speakers um, share certain characteristics in their design work. They both like to design spare, sophisticated, modern projects that focus on massing and space. Both explore a range of spatial and compositional geometries, employing vaults, gables through intersections, extractions, and other operations which create striking volumes inhabited in compelling ways. Their work shows an interest in abstraction as well as in effects of light and transparency produced by elemental materials in the Singapore sunshine and climate. In many ways, both Christina and Shing's work appears to speak to larger international interests in design as much as they address specifics of context, climate, and place. So we're very excited to have both of them with us today and are looking forward to seeing their projects uh, and engaging them in some discussion. But first, a little biographical information. Christina Tian is actually quite mysterious. We had a very hard time finding out much about your bio online. Um, almost everything there was about Park and Associates with relatively few details about yourself. Um, but here's what we do know about Christina. She's a director of Park and Associates. Um, people and the human experience are, are fundamental considerations in her approach to architecture. She's a firm believer in Park and Associates design philosophy that each project is an opportunity to transform space into a delightful experience. Christina undertakes her role as design director with the aspiration and commitment to deliver experiences regardless of scale that transcend visual stimulation as well as resonate with the individual. Her architectural pursuits at Park and Associates have attracted numerous architecture and design awards, earning critical acclaim locally, um, such as the President's Design Award, um, and internationally. She's co-chaired the Singapore Institute of Architects membership committee in 2015 and 2016, and currently serves on the Board of Architects panel of examiners. She graduated from the University of Adelaide in 2000. Um, I know a little bit more about Xing. Um, she's a registered architect um, and director of Lecker Architects. She was raised in Singapore in the UK um, and attended Harvard University, completing three degrees, a BA in Fine Arts, as well as Master's in Architecture and Landscape Architecture, the latter two with distinction. Uh, Xing relocated to Shanghai as a Wheelwright Fellow with Harvard in 2002 to research the Art Deco housing of the French Concession. Uh, excited by small-scale innovations occurring in socialized interiors there, she documented residents' living spaces and personal history. She's been practicing design in Singapore since 2004. Recent projects by Xing include buildings and landscape with a focus on residential and educational projects uh, and projects for the arts. Since the birth of her three children, Xing has found an interest in design for children working on preschools, kindergartens, and playgrounds, as well as events and cultural spaces tailored for younger audiences. Um, more recently also, she's been working in the field of aging and dementia, working with the URA here with the LKYCIC, Lian Foundation, and other organizations to propose new design strategies for aging in a creative and dignified way. She's also the co-author of a book called Horror and Architecture, which is a great book, and I encourage you all to go and buy it at retail prices. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming our guest to speak tonight. Thank you. Hey, um, hello, and even though uh, I'm the one who is standing up and speaking about my firm's work, and there's mysteriously a picture of me looking like I'm alone in the office, um, obviously Josh and I work together, and you know, even though we're talking about women architects, I mean, we work together as um, part of big teams. 
Um, so, wait. What am I pointing at? Thank you. Okay, so this is a picture of the people in our office um, a few months ago. Um, Josh isn't pictured there, but he's sitting right here in front. Um, and so, you know, it's really, it takes a huge number of people to make um, architecture work. So it's definitely not, you know, we don't operate as lone wolves. Um, I'm going to show you seven projects today. Um, three of them, the really colorful ones are obviously for the, ch for children, um, and the rest of them are, are not. Um, it's just a random selection of what we've been doing over the past five years, maybe. So the ga Gallery House um, is a project that we did in Geylang as part of a group of young architects that were chosen slash exploited to do very cheap work for seven um, houses in a row, seven row, uh, shop houses in a row. And we were supposed to conserve um, the shop house, but we were allowed to build an extension towards the back. And so it was a very cool project actually uh, because the developer's brief was simply to create something that had um, what he called just had oomph um, it was just very vague and we had to basically make this this project for potential tenants who loved art so they, it had to be a home and a gallery mixed together and so our take on it was because we could have a very different back compared with the front, because the back was obviously a new addition. We decided to make the gallery entrance from the back and have the front um, remain as the, the, cons uh, the conserved residential facade. So this is a section taken through the, the, the residential um, posh facades on the front, and then this is that gallery entrance at the back. And all of this was added um, on as part of the extension. I think it could have actually gone to eight floors, but the budget made it made us cap it at four. Um, and so it was really, you know, row houses like this, they're very narrow. They're about five meters wide and about 25 meters long, as you can see from the plan. And so it was really a very simple um, operation of adding voids so that you could bring in lights, you know, adding um, sculptural stairs and, and um, introducing the idea that this was a house also for art. And so, what we chose to do was to create um, a, a very, s have a very sculptural addition to the shop house, which you can see at the top, it's basically a rotated uh, cube, um, ex extruded cube, which had all the, the bedrooms above, but at the bottom, uh, as you can see from the, that back gallery entrance, um, is a dining room slash gallery. And it was quite nice, because the tenants really do love art and they have nice um, exhibitions every now and again. The staircase itself was also supposed to be a sculptural element. Um, I'm just going to run through that here, um, which you can see. We, you know, part of the thing is we we work on projects with very low budgets, very low, and so we have almost no recourse to materiality. We end up having to work a lot with massing um, and very very sort of almost abstract um, materials. It's but just basically plaster and paint. So we have to rely on form most of the time to kind of tell the story. So this is the staircase that takes us up um, into the, the rest of the house with um, little windows overlooking on the inside, which I think, yeah, we see here. So this was the strategy. Shop houses are very interesting because you have a lot of toilets looking interiorly. You know, there's so little external facade. So we had to come up with ways of bringing light in and yet maintaining privacy. And that is the, the back facade. You can see the rotated uh, residential um, living space within the gallery. The next project is actually kind of close to a, a dream project, um, as close to that as, as we got, because Josh and I both um, studied landscape architecture and architecture in, in graduate school. And this was a, an opportunity for us to design both um, with almost equal importance. There was nothing that was sort of subservient to the other. And um, 
it was also interesting because it was a project we designed from afar. The cemetery is in a tiny village, like two hours outside of Nanjing, and we went there only a, a few times, and we had very little control actually over how it was built, um, you know, over, the, over communicating with the workers and, and all that kind of stuff that we really get into when we're working in projects in Singapore. So it's a private cemetery um, built on an existing landscape nursery, uh, which basically is a big piece of land that people used to grow trees for sale. And what we were, so we were given this piece of land that had an existing, very Chinese, symmetrical sort of courtyard building there. Um, and an existing burial plot, which was the cemetery. And so the person who commissioned this project um, is a Singaporean businessman from China. And when he died, he wanted to be buried here with his ancestors. And so what's, what's interesting is in order to, I mean, this was, this was a, a sort of guess on his part, but in order to make sure that he would be able to rest in peace forever, he decided to buy the land um, around it, so this entire nursery, and develop it as a public park so that it would have a public value and therefore have a chance of surviving longer than, than if it was just a privatized piece of land. And so um, there were some existing elements on the site, as I mentioned, but we began this process of adding in little um, pavilions and gateways to turn this nursery into a park. We also had um, a lot of existing trees, of course, but they're planted in rows, you know, like a farm. And so we removed um, a lot of them and, and added a lot more and then created a series of pavilions. Um, in the tradition of cemetery parks, and there's an amazing tradition of cemetery parks that have these pavilions for contemplation and for um, sort of rest, you know, as you move through. And so we, we wanted to do our take on that. So right in the middle, uh, we made a sort of rolling garden. Um, and this was the centerpiece of the, of the park. I'll show you more of this later. But I want to show you the cemeteries. So this is what the actual burial mounds look like um, in this part of China. They're amazing. They're just grass mounds. And they often have a lot of um, straw coming out the, the top. And so this was the centerpiece that we couldn't touch, right? But it was, it was the excuse for the park. So we added this sort of rolling, um, sort of almost an English picturesque kind of landscape, C cutting rivers through it that were sometimes flooded with water because part of this site, um, the site has to manage rainwater, right? Uh, any water that flows into it. And so part of that um, is managing rainwater, but then a, a lot of the times of the year, it's dry. So we planted um, wildflowers through these rivers, so you get rivers of flowers during the springtime. It's a close-up you see of the, the these little bridges that cross over. Um, the materials were very simple, all locally sourced, you know, and we decided that we would try and do a lot of cast concrete because the, the workers who were in the village around seemed very open to trying this, even though they, they really had never done it before. So it has a very mute, kind of timeless um, design language that has to do, obviously, with contemplation of life and death. Um, there, you can see here, um, a lot of the existing landscape is, is pine, um, pine and cypress trees. So we kept that and, and added in a few pavilions. Um, so these ones we are the pine pavilions. They're a little bit like Hansel and Gretel. We like to tell stories about our projects and make up analogies. And this one is, you know, they're like two lost uh, twins in the wood. So this is the, the view of them from the back. And then there are a series of pavilions um, that also play on the theme of doubles. So I mean, these, these are very formal operations. Um, we're very interested, you know, having come from the GSD, we have this formal baggage, you know, experimenting with um, what happens when you join two things that are the same, you know, what happens when you um, rotate them and split them, you know, all these kinds of operations. But what was also really nice was um, the site, the, the burial ground was for this man and his wife, and they'd been together for like 70 years before she died. And so there was this um, slightly romantic notion of 
you know, of couples, of, of pairs, and a sort of architectural response to that. You can see the, here, this is another one um, in, a, in a Cyprus, um, Cyprus mound hill, I guess, yeah. So that they're all um, created such that there are areas for sitting and, and looking out at the rest of the landscape. So the next project I'm going to show is really quite a departure. I mean, we do a lot of work also for kids. As Josh mentioned earlier, because we have young kids, we've suddenly been thrown back into the mind of, you know, little ones and how they perceive things. And so we have been approached by quite a number of school operators to do schools and children's activity centers. And what we like about it is that kids are really very, very attuned to their environment. So any little thing that you do, they notice. It's not like us adults who are so, we're so kind of, I don't know, we've seen it all, we're all so jaded, we don't get impressed by very much, but it's really fun working for kids. And so this was the first school that we did. Um, it's a lab school, so they train teachers here. And this was the kind of site that we were given before. So I mentioned we do lots of different types of work. We do a lot of interiors as well. So this was an interior project um, in an institutional building with no views out. Um, and you know, it's just, just a very giant anonymous space. So we created a, a schoolhouse within this um, so, that, so that kids could relate to it. I, I guess that's the simplest way to explain it. Um, and because it deals with an age range from uh, six months through six years, we had to find a way to segregate them because you know six year, six month olds make a lot of noise, right? And then the six year olds are slightly more controlled, and so we needed to find ways to segregate the space as well. So um, it was a lot of um, design thinking about how children move. Uh, we had very little chairs, very few chairs, um, even though there are a few stools here, but a lot of the, the design, um, the furniture that we design are just platforms so that children can lie on them and roll on them and you know, occupy, um, occupy them without having to just sit up straight, which is actually very bad for kids and they end up fidgeting all the time. We also had a lot of fun producing ways for them to actually get up and see the view. So mounds are one way to do it. Another one was we had these, um, um, periscopes so they could look out at the view beyond while, while sitting at their level. Um, for play, which is a very big thing for kids, you know, how do you create spaces for them to play? We didn't want to have conventional playground material, you know, playground equipment, so we made a series of little, p little follies that were very abstracted versions of um, Things that we might see, you know, in our environment, like factory buildings, or you know, it could be a crocodile, um, <coughs> or it could just be, you know, a garden shed. It, we 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 tried to make um, versions of these for the children to play in instead of slides and swings. So this main element in the middle is um, the observation booth, where the tr teachers in training will come and observe the children around them. There was also, um, so I showed you just now that shed that's in this semi-outdoor play area. Again, we were really trying to work on the language of abstraction so that um, kids can kind of um, inflect upon that whatever they, they see. Oops, I can't play it. Wait. <coughs> it's a little video we made of the space. So the Caterpillar's Cove, um, won a President's Design Award uh, in 2015. Um, and it was a real turning point, I think, in the field of childcare design in Singapore, because prior to that, we can't show it, never mind, uh, be be because it was the first time that um, a childcare project was given so much emphasis on design. Prior to that, kids really are not, were not in Singapore thought of as being sort of really worthy clients deserving a lot of, um, you know, design value. So that was, that was really great. And since then, we've seen a lot of um, difference in childcare projects. Now, I mean, the level of it is just super high right now. Everybody's doing great childcare work. 
So the Art Ground is um, a project for um, a woman who used to work at the Esplanade. She used to be in charge of their, their children's theater. And she rented the space in Goodman Art Center. It's an old school building, which you can <coughs> see here. It's the old school hall, right? And um, what she wanted was for us to create uh, a sort of a, an artist space for her. So what, what we made was something like a black box, except it's a white box, um, a little bit less uh, sort of dark and foreboding, uh, so that they can turn it into different um, kinds of environments, um, depending on, on the performers that they bring in and such. So this was, this was fun. I mean, we had won a project, um, a, a design competition for, the, for an art pavilion using the same structural system, and it never went ahead because the client couldn't raise the money to build it. So we got to kind of build another version of it um, inside this, this hall. And this is also unusual for us because we got to actually take part in a lot of the construction. You know, in Singapore, we architects don't really build very often. I mean, in the States, you do that a lot. You build your own stuff, but um, we, we don't do that much here. So in some small way, we got to be involved in the facade paneling and be really anal about alignments, and th that was quite fun. So this is the box. Um, you can see this. It's a, it's a light extruded steel box with a corrugated um, polycarbonate cladding. And from the inside, this is one of the, the, the art installations that was done recently. Um, you know, it can be sort of decorated like a stage, however they want, the windows open and close. It can be totally light controlled. Um, this was a really fun uh, installation that they did where they built these like tents inside that are very womb-like and it was just incredible. So it, it's fun to be involved in projects that really take on a life after you're done that, you know, is tasteful and beautiful and you don't have to worry about the clients um, putting their ugly furniture in there and, you know, you don't, you don't ever get to, to see it looking nice again. Um, it's also an inclusive school. This is something very important to us. We do a lot of work, as Josh mentioned, like for, for uh, considering aging and for um, inclusive education. And so part of the, the goal was to be able to allow um, children in, in wheelchairs to be pushed up onto the stage. So um, we, we made this sort of ramp stage extension. It's also a nice little garden outside. So if you know little kids, you should take them there. Playbox is another kids project at the Esplanade. Um, and it was for the same client before she left. And I just want to show you, we do a lot of work in weird sites. Like this is just leftover circulation space outside the theaters. You know, this is that, the dome of one of the Esplanade, um, one of the two, two <coughs> masses. Uh, and this is just leftover space that was uh, circulation outside the theater. But um, the, the Esplanade decided to ask us to come and put something in there. I just want to show you the section. It's incredibly, you know, it's between the theater and that glass wall. It's incredibly hot. It's very narrow. It's strange um, because the, the facade is leaning back. You know, there's no headroom. So anyway, we thought, how do we design and put something in here without carving it up yet further into lots of tiny spaces? So we thought about um, little objects that would open up sort of claim worlds around them, around, around them, you know, as opposed to dividing up into little rooms. So for example, what you have here is a box that opens up and there is a, a cove, an alcove inside where a storyteller can sit, can sit there and then the children can sit in this sort of spilling, spill out area around it. This is the idea, boxes contain worlds, right? That they open up and then it's all this magical stuff that comes out. So. Um, it's a strategy, I think, that uh, was very successful because you can still, you know, in such a narrow space, um, perceive there's still a sense of openness. It, it was one of those storytelling events. And so we, we, we do use a lot of color sometimes. I mean, this is something that we... When we do a lot of adult work, it's super, it's super black and white, and then when we do kids' stuff, it's, it's really colorful, but um, we're not uncomfortable with color. Oh, I just wanted to just, so this, this is another um, sort of exploration of how to do play equipment, uh, but 
thinking about sen the senses. So this is about sensory exploration. It's you know telephone tubes. Um, there is a kaleidoscope in there, which is the first image that I showed you. You know when the wind blows, the weather vanes move, and so do the clouds, and you get this um, very immersive experience in in your environment. Okay, so the next um, project is a competition that we that we took part in a couple years ago, and it, it's. It's, it's nice to try and do something for a different, very different environment than the one that we live in, because in work in Singapore is so much um, dictated by the kind of climate that we live in that it was really nice to do something in Chicago. And Josh grew up in Chicago, so he has a very um, visceral understanding of what it is like to live there in the winter and in the summer. It's super hot, and in the winter it's freezing beyond imagination. And so this was a um, competition for the um, first Chicago um, Architecture Biennale. And it was a pavilion to be used in the Biennale and then trans taken apart and transported to the lakefront where it would be a kiosk on the lakefront, much like the other hot dog stands that exist there. Um, and we came as the a final four out of 140, which we were just like completely stunned by. Unfortunately, we didn't win it. but. Um, it's a project that's meant to be able be, to be read in the summer and in the winter. So it has this, um, a lot of operability. You see here the, the facade opens up to, um, so that it can become an actual kiosk. Uh, the, the wall, hang on, I just want to show you. Yeah, the, the end wall rotates as well um, so that the whole thing can be opened up. But what, what, what we found really fun about working on this was to experiment with an expression in an architectural mass that went from something quite mute to something quite articulate and to carry that through into the facade. And so it's done in a very simple way using just um, you know, laser etching into, into plywood. And, and this is what it would look like when it's totally opened up in the summer. Okay, this is the last project I'm showing. Um, Funan Show Suite, we did this for Capital Land. So, you know, I think looking at our office, we really are, we do all kinds of stuff. We work for many different kinds of clients and, and many different kinds of programs. And when, we when I was asked to do this talk about the direction of the office, I was just thinking, I, I, really, I really don't know what it is. We kind of do whatever's interesting that, and comes along. You know, we don't really want to develop any one specialty. Um, and it's quite fun to have very different things because then it's, it's not so boring. You know, you're not sort of repeating um, just wh what you know. So anyway, this Funan show suite, I mean, you all know the Funan Mall and how it's been knocked down, and a lot of people were very upset by it, and Josh and I included. We didn't quite understand why it was being knocked down and what was being proposed to replace it, which is a mall for um, millennials. And what, what does that really mean anyway? We didn't, we didn't really understand that, and yet, um, we were asked to kind of be the bridge and to interpret what that would be like so that we could make a show suite that would start um, the life of the mall now while it's being built. Um, so it's not a normal show suite in the sense that, you know, it, you bring in prospective clients, uh, tenants, and you kind of show them what the mall is going to look like so that they can rent spaces. I mean, it does that as well, but it's also uh, meant to be almost like a a new community center. It's supposed to build a new community, and I think they've done an amazing job at it because they hired people to, to actually do that, to program it and to run these events. Um, Shophouse and Co. do that for this, and it's been actually quite, quite an interesting new sort of hub. So it's built on an empty piece of land, which honestly we didn't even know it was a site. It just was a bit of leftover land um, next to the Treasury Building. And, um, it's meant to give you a glimpse into the mall, and so we thought about looking into worlds, you know, getting a view into lots of different worlds. And so um, we we made this jumble of of windows, almost like when you're walking around at night and you get to peer into people's homes, and you get suddenly um, a view into something other than than what you what you know. Um, it's two floors, and it's basically very connected to the space around it, so that people can you know, move through it, are invited to walk through. There's, there's a weird element here, which is this uh, bicycle path. I don't know, in the, in the new mall, you're supposed to be able to, to ride your bike through the mall. Um, so they wanted that to be in this show suite as well. 
the second floor. So um, it has to serve some of those functions I was mentioning before, you know, showing people what the building is going to look like. So this is a VR room showing you what the, the real Funan is going to be. But um, it also is the venue for um, a lot of makers' workshops um, and um, a lot of talks. So the, the main part of it is this amphitheater. This is what I was showing you just now, the bicycle path that runs through amphitheater. A lot of the design language has to echo a little bit what the future building will bring. So there's a lot of this industrial chic kind of, um, you know, uh, material, a lot of metal and mesh. But what we found really fun was um, imagining the kinds of activities that would take place inside and how to sort of bring them out onto the street as well as within that atrium space. Thank you. Let me try this. Uh, thank you, Josh, for the invite. And um, thank you to the rest of you for taking time out of your evening to, to be here. Um, okay. So I'm actually flashing these images uh, on the screen because that's how we often browse architecture nowadays in our social media generation about one second every single image. And since I'm in a room full of, uh, not really a room, but uh, of future architects, I felt that it would be more meaningful if I were to go behind the scenes of these images and try to share with you our ideas and processes behind just three of our projects the disappointments and hope that we have. And despite and in spite of all this, we still remain very committed and very excited about the practice of architecture. Okay, um, The first project, I'm sorry, um, would be our office in uh, Kim Yem. So back in 2013, we had to uh, relocate because uh, our studio was getting bigger and we were starting to feel that the rent was getting kind of expensive where our building used to be. So space hunting was tough. We took many months. Um, that's what happens when architects get together. They can't seem to agree on stuff. Um, and we just happened to stumble into this old school building. Uh, try and show you the images here. And um, what do you know? We uh, fell in love with this building. It was love at first sight. Um, sorry, I'm a bit corny here. Um, and falling in love was easy, but attempting to negotiate with the landlord was a separate story. Uh, at many points, we were tempted to just give up and go away because he was just being too difficult. Um, obviously, we didn't, and we managed to work it through. So how did we start the design process? It was a really simple idea. We just wanted to string a series of experiences together um, to form a journey. So this was what the entrance foyer used to look like uh, before we moved in. And um, we were thinking, what should we do with the reception? We have always been quite enamored with um, wanting to explore arrival experiences. Um, so we, we wanted to create a space that would speak to you intuitively. Um, to say that you have arrived, even though we don't really want to employ a full-time receptionist um, to sit there to greet you. So we inserted these uh, steel arches to exaggerate the barrel vault. Um, and we wanted to create like a cathedral-like uh, space to greet the visitor with silence. Uh, with most offices, after you arrive, you will tend to make your way to the waiting area to wait for whomever you have to meet. Um, 
in our case, we decide to arrive at the pantry, which is the space that you see underneath that three uh, blacked out uh, barrel vaults. In our previous offices, um, our pantry was always tucked away in the corner, and it was always messy. Uh, I guess people just don't take care of spaces when they're in the corner. And so we figured, right, why not put the pantry right at the beginning of the office, like right at the front of the office, and make it like a reception area, uh, enlarge it, make it feel like a cafe, and then put it on display. That way, we would have no choice but to keep the place neat. So that's uh, our cafe space now. Um, we use it for internal meetings and reviews. It's like for casual stuff. Um, we also thought it would be a good place for architects to decompress when they get a bit stressed out. Um, go there, have a latte, um, surf internet, watch YouTube. Um, what, what was strange was that at the end of the day, uh, our clients actually quite like to hang out here and um, have a coffee, have a meeting. So it has worked out quite well, and it's been um, four years now, and it's still quite neat. There is actually a formal, uh, on the wall to your left, there's actually a formal meeting room to the back of the wall, but uh, not that many people use the meeting room anymore, except for tender interviews and boring stuff. Uh, still part of the cafe. Uh, I think sometimes architects like to hang out here and just chill out when they get really stressed. Okay, um, the next space would be the working space where we actually work, um, where we're not hanging out and drinking coffee. Uh, this was the original idea for the working space. Uh, we wanted to extend the barrel vaults um, that you saw in the reception into the working space. Uh, because of budget constraints and time constraints, we had to can it. Um, that was quite disappointing at that point in time because you know we had prepared all the SketchUp and all the drawings. Um, but I think with hindsight, I feel that it, it, the space works better without the vaults. So on the left is before we moved in, and then the right is uh, what it is now. According to my colleagues, they really enjoy the amount of daylight flooding into the working space and how spacious it is. Because we choose to uh, ignore efficiency and align the seats to the barrel vaults. So this is the plan of um, the whole office. Number 10 is the working space. If you look at the corner at 11, um, that's, that's my workspace. So the designers thought it would be um, funny to try and house me in a dog house. So that's where I sit nowadays. Um, yeah, that's, um, okay, that's my seat. This is the cross section of the whole office. The left is where we came in at the reception. And then the middle open platform is our workspace. At that point in time when we were designing this, I think um, we were also working with a client in KL on a few projects. Um, he was a very interesting, uh, temperamental, and demanding client because he always wanted new experiences. Um, an example would be we were working with him for um, 750 units of houses, um, gated community, and he wanted to subdivide it into 13 parcels so that we could create 13 different concepts for each of this parcel. And within each of this parcel have different variations of the houses so that he could um, sell different experiences. I, I think at, at a point, uh, we did so much work with him that he really influenced how we thought. And that is um, how we have treated the spaces, um, that there is the reception that is really stark, sorry, the entrance for it is really stark, the cafe that's a bit more rich in terms of material use, and then back to the workspace, which was uh, really quite old school. Nanyang Girls High School. Uh, we incepted this in late 2013, and we completed this project last year. It's an A&A. &A. Um, so in 2013, we were invited to express interest um, to participate in the close 
design competition. Um, and we told them we are obviously keen, um, but we never heard back from them again. And about uh, a month later, they called my boss and they asked him, like, you know, you have not replied our email, are you going to turn up for the design presentation? And that's when we found out that the email went straight to his junk mailbox. And we had about a week to rush out the whole design presentation when originally we were given about three. Um, so that was a real adrenaline rush. Okay, so this is the site. It's at the corner of uh, Linden and Dunyan. Um, brief, the school envisioned the new extension to be two large symmetrical four-story blocks that has facilities that included the additional uh, academic and co-curricular spaces, a large performing arts centre housing about 300, and an indoor sports hall with, I think, about six badminton courts. So that, um, that green field you see there, that's the future site. So we followed the brief um, because we had so little time. Uh, we built up two buildings and then we started to dress up the facade. Um, I'm going to show you one of our uh, options that we did back in then time. Uh, I can't say I'm proud of it. Um, we didn't like it. Uh, it wasn't just the facade treatment, but also the messing just felt wrong. It was uh, blocking the clock tower, which we felt was really uh, important to the school. And it sat rather awkwardly on the site. And so we went back to the drawing board. Often with an A and A scheme, it's always a debate on how do we respond to the old building. Uh, does the new scheme speak louder and perhaps overwhelm or just hide the old building? Um, in this case, we couldn't, because uh, I think that the building behind was designed by the former first lady, so it was really important to Nanyang. So do we then blend in and we make the original, and at, or at a stretch, we interpret the old facade in modern contemporary language, right? Um, in this instance, we chose to sidestep the question and yet remain sensitive to the context. Um, we feel that we have created a, a non-building, and we call it a non-building because we feel it's more landscape than building. So this is what we've done. Um, there's the existing building, um, which is the clock tower. We actually, the, the two blocks of four story, we compressed it into three stories, and we sunk it into the ground, uh, one and a half stories. And then we um, lifted up the planes and sort of connected it, the top roof, and the bottom green field with a curved slope. And there's a side plan of uh, how it looks. And there's a cross section um, of how the, from ground level onwards, you actually only see the gentle green slopes. And, and all the activities are happening below ground. So that's um, the drone photography. Uh, I think one of the disappointments that we, we had during the uh, committee dialogue sessions was that they, even though they, they really liked the scheme, there were certain um, programs that they wanted to incorporate. And because of that, it actually affected the perfect symmetry of the slopes. And I, I feel that whenever I walk around the site these days, I would still feel like that we didn't quite achieve the perfect symmetry. Um, what else can we learn from this? I guess the M&E services coordination, um, I think good concepts and ideas are just the beginning. Uh, the execution is really just as important and I felt that if we had spent more time um, and not overlooked some of the services and made them neater, that it would have benefited some of the spaces. So that's actually the courtyard that's in the basement, and that's looking down into the basement. Um, happy moment uh, in this project was when, uh, after the project was completed, the school actually invited us back um, to have a presentation. I mean, the students had a presentation, and they actually made a video of how they used the space, and they wanted to say thank you to the whole construction team and also the architects. That's the indoor sports hall. Uh, and that's the multi-purpose hall where they practice lion dance and dragon dance. 
and the debts on the ground as well. Okay, finally, to the last project that we are um, recurring. We're currently working on this house. Um, it, we incepted it early last year. Construction started early this year. And we're hoping to complete this project in September next year. So a father bought a piece of land, um, 1,400 square meters, next to his own house for his two kids and their nuclear family. Uh, when we received the brief, it was just two separate houses with some shared living space. The clients, uh, as a family, they're really nice and easygoing. Um, and they're very happy to let the architect take the lead. They have no preference where aesthetics is concerned. And they have no concern about budget as well. They are happy to spend. Like, um, we thought it was a really perfect client until we got introduced to the feng shui master. <laughs> so he came along with his feng shui diagram, uh, dictating the spaces, where goes what and what goes where. And we had to uh, give him certain specific angles of how some things must face. Um, this is a diagram of our scheme. Uh, the block on the left is the father's house. The block facing Fifth Avenue on the right is um, one of the siblings' house, and the one at the bottom is the other sibling's house. Um, they had to be there. Uh, well, we, we, this was what we thought had to happen because of the feng shui directions. And um, we had to maximize the view because it's actually perched on high ground, and everybody wanted a piece of the view of the city. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Bukit Timah Hill. They could see Bukit Timah Hill from here. Um, and this was the plan that happened. And the, the slant are all uh, feng shui inspired. Um, yeah. So we, we, had about, we had about a month uh, to come up with the design concept. And halfway through it, um, I guess we started to really hate it. Um, and then what do we do? Back to the drawing board again. And we, we, we were just like uh, dis discussing and we were just imagining like the father, right, as the village head and uh, the children are the villagers, right? And how the village head would be in this huge house and the little villager huts would be all where his little minions would stay. And, um, and then we would create an internal courtyard and um, yeah. So that's, that's what happened. Um, so it's, it's a series of pavilions and this same pavilions are tiered as a response to the, to the site. I think, if I'm not wrong, I think there is like a, a nine meter height difference, sorry, about eight to nine meter height difference between the top of the slide and the bottom of the slide, if I don't recall wrongly. Um, so so that's, that's, that's what happened. Nine meter. So um, the re resulting series of pavilions, besides being a design concept and feature, they also help to uh, manage and mediate the bulk that the client's spatial requirements. Um, I think if the, t the total GFA is actually stated there, it's about uh, 16,000 square feet. Yeah, that's uh, kind of large. It's actually one of the first uh, huge, huge bungalows that we have done. Um, some of the plans, sketch plans. These are some images of the scheme and uh, also of the close-up detailing. So we, we wanted to, to evoke the feel of a Chinese village. And that's the detailing. Um, we actually, we, we, hope, we hope to bring this initial design concept into built form, uh, looking like how we, we have designed it. I think that is a really distinct concept that is also evident in the architecture, so hopefully it, it works out. Um, I had a heart attack moment last week when the client texted me uh, at night to say that he wasn't so sure about the timber cladding because um, he's really, really concerned that he cannot attain class zero fire rating because of the recent aluminium uh, paneling scare. Um, I think we have kind of resolved it now. He, uh, we have gone to FSB for consultation, and uh, I think it's going to work out. Okay, th the work that we've done over the years, um, they have evolved, and the languages and the ideas that we explore has changed, but we always recognize the importance of people and the human experience in architecture. 
And in every piece of design that we create, no matter the scale, we seek to create objects and spaces that resonate with the individual. And every project is customized and crafted with rigor through a painstaking process, building upon the client's expectations and challenging our previous works while respectfully responding to the site context. Uh, I just want to leave you with um, something that I read um, from Louis Kahn's last speeches in um, 1973 at the Pratt Institute. He noted that when all was said and done, the architect's job was to make an offering of man to the next man. That to him was joy. He says, if you don't feel joy in what you're doing, then you're not really operating. And you will, experience pro you will probably experience great frustration as architects, but really, he concluded, joy will prevail. Thank you. Thanks, thank you to both of you for those, um, for your presentations. Um, I guess my first question is for Christina. I, I think it's interesting how part of the story um, right from the beginning was this question about the growth of the office and having to move and, and relocate to the, to the new facility and how much that's kind of changed a lot of the day-to-day -day life and working of the firm. Um, and one of the things that's been an interesting recurring theme with our talks thus far this term has been the question of the scale of the firm, um, about the size of practice, um, the trade-offs uh, between growing and, and developing new capacities, but then maybe losing sometimes a sense of intimacy um, that you begin the practice with and having to adjust to new ways of working. Um, so I wanted to ask you how that experience of, of growth has been with, um, with Park and Associates. I mean, it seems like the, for example, like taking on new typologies, like the large multi-generational house and so on, um, brings kind of new interests and, and also new frustrations with it. Um, I, I joined the office when we were about um, maybe five of us, and I think there are about 60 of us now. Um, I, I feel it's, it's actually strangely still the same. Um, I in fact, I think the transition was when uh, not so much the size of the office, but the direction that the firm decided to take, where for maybe about um, eight, nine years, we were doing bread and butter projects, where we would just do uh, condominium after condominium after cluster housing. And um, I think it was in 2009 when we decided to when my boss decided to make the switch uh, because he felt that uh, he just didn't see the sense in continuing that practice, he was just doing bread and butter work. Mm. Um, and, and that I felt was the, the, the big change in trying to be more design oriented in the firm. And the size of the firm just grew, but we still tried to keep as much of a studio atmosphere as possible. Mm. If, if anything, um, maybe because we are larger, we are maybe not that equipped to be large, <laughs> and therefore we are probably more disorganized and maybe less efficient. That's interesting. So <laughs> in some ways, it's a big firm that still runs like a, like a small one in some ways. Yes. And then was maintaining that, that sense of intimacy a part of the brief for the new office? It seems like it works very well in the sense that you have a lot of informal spaces that have kind of made the more formal meeting rooms and things obsolete. Yeah, I think, I think it has. Um, Strangely, when we were in a smaller space at Cecil Street, um, there were just like 20 of all of us. And even though we were in such a small space, right, we, we were feeling, fr maybe perhaps because of the space constraint, feeling really frustrated with each other. And, uh, but when we moved to a bigger space, I felt that we, we actually make the effort to walk to somewhere and have a coffee with someone and then have a dialogue with, with someone. So, mm. so uh, yeah, we, we still try to keep that intimacy happening. In terms of scale, I, this is a question for, for both of you, I think, in terms of um, project scale, as opposed to, say, office scale. I um, was interested to know if there's a kind of an ideal scale or an ideal project um, that you've ever wanted to do, or a project that you've done that you would happily repeat, um, because the, either the, the scale or, or the, um, the brief was particularly fascinating. 
I mean, for us, because we're so small, we are less than 10 people. Um, we can't really manage large projects. Um, in fact, our largest project is like a 2,500 square meter building, which, because of its size, required so many, um, you know, like green mark, for example, and you know, all these like um, detention tank calculations, all those kinds of things which um, really burden an office beyond just producing the architecture. There's a lot of follow-up, paperwork, um, you, you know, that, that kind of, um, I feel, detracts from what we're good at doing. And so I would say our, our limit, yeah, is, is, you know, less than 2,000 square meters, um, simply because of all that other stuff that gets, that kind of murks the waters. You know, you kind of can't concentrate on what you're actually good at doing. Um, so for, for me, it's an authorities driven it's, it's a sort of um, responsibility-driven limit. So is in the ideal scale, like the, say, good class bungalow or something even smaller? Yeah, although, you know, we rarely meet clients like that who will, will let you do anything, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we don't care what it looks like. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's quite although amazing. Although we have met some horrible feng shui masters. We have had feng shui masters, yeah. We, we did one building where um, he came back with the recommendation that everyone had to face away from the windows. It was an office. Everyone had to face away from the windows and the middle of the factory floor had to have three gold coins like right there and it had to have like a five meter offset radius around the three gold coins. And so the guy just went to a different feng shui master and got a different recommendation. <laughs> but um, is that the first project you've worked on that had where you've had to manage that? Uh, a feng shui master? Yeah. Uh, no. Um, we have different types like of feng shui masters. We, we seem to meet uh, different. Uh, actually, recently we've met a lot of them, and uh, actually this guy is considered the best of the lot that I've met. Uh, with some of them, they pretty much draw out the whole layout. Design for the you. house, yeah. For you. yeah. <laughs> so, has there been one kind of standout pro project typology that you enjoy doing? Was it th was it the office? It seems that there's a lot of joy in that. Yeah, we we enjoyed doing the office, but possibly because we were our own client. So I don't know how often that can, can it happen. That could be the best or the worst <laughs> thing, I think. I remember talking to Maria Warner about how it took them so long to design their house. It was because they couldn't agree on what they wanted to do. Wow. The two architects who are married could never design a house. Luckily, Sorry. we live in an old house. Yeah. We would never be able to do that. So um, turning a little bit to the the question of like the Singapore context more generally, because you know this whole series of conversations has been with Singapore architects um, and, and getting their feelings not only about their own career, but uh, also about this as a context to practice. Um, so I, we've been asking one question, which I find we get very interesting responses, um, is do you feel that there is currently a kind of emerging Singaporean architectural practice, or something that's very identifiable, which you can see alongside very identifiable national practices like say Swiss architecture, which I think when we think of that, we all have a certain image of what that is. Um, or say Japanese architecture, there's a certain image associated with that as well. Do you think that Singapore architecture is developing a, a kind of an analogous um, kind of identity or personality or language? Um, no, I mean, I, I, I don't see I, I don't really see uh, a language that can be identified with. If anything, the only thing I think that is very Singaporean is the sloping 45 degree attic roof. Mm. It's um, yeah. <laughs> That that's really Singaporean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we struggled against that many times, the the attic roof uh, reg regulation. Um, but I mean, yeah, I think in Singapore there is a great sort of obsession with the weather, um, and it does sort of produce a certain. I mean, the the, fo the forty five degree roof is roof obviously comes from, you know, the, the attic envelope guideline, right? Mm. But, but it's also um, very much driven by concerns about rain. I mean, even if you didn't have to contend with that, you know, this idea about flat roofs not being mm. so good and we have to worry about, you know, what happens when it rains and all our windows are open and, you know, all of that. And I feel that it's, um, that there does seem to be, not in everybody, but in a lot of especially um, smaller buildings, um, sort of retreat um, of the facade. Like there was a lot of there's a lot of layering in the facade. Mm. 
you know, with, with um, grills and louvres and, and, and all of that, that kind of, in a way, there are all these veils around the exterior of the building. Um, and it seems like quite a big, con quite a big concern, you know, the aging of the building and how it, how it deals with weather. Was that part of the concern with the timber facade, your uh, commune client, oh, um, about the aging of the material? Or is it more to do with it? Yes, yes. Th that's uh, a question we answer every two weeks. Will the material will age? It, will it age? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know your answer to that. Um, <laughs> yes, it will age, yeah. uh, but it will age slowly because yeah. it's uh, Akoya. Not trying to endorse Akoya here, but um, we have used it in projects before and it works quite well. It does age well. Yeah. It's interesting how, uh, though, that weathering is a concern. Like we find this very often with clients that are very concerned that their building is going to weather, whereas we find the idea that the building is going to weather beautiful nice. and yeah. part of the life yeah. of a building and one of the things that makes architecture kind of lively. And But there's this idea that it needs to be like fresh out of the box in the same 10 years later that it is on day one. Strange expectation. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I understand where you're coming from. I rem remember that there was um, once that we took part in a competition and we... Um, proposed uh, off-form concrete, and we were saying that, you know, it'd be nice, because it's in the forested area, we were hoping for the algae to grow on the concrete to so that it becomes part of the environment. And uh, I think the jury did think that it was such a brilliant idea. Yeah, I can imagine that <laughs> there's no love for algae <laughs> in the immediate environment. Um, so perhaps at this point, we can open up to a couple of questions from the audience. If there are people who have a specific question for Shane or for Christina, we have microphones set up. This is the moment where everyone gets really nervous, even if they want to ask a question. Ronald, you always ask the first I'm question. I'm shaking my head at Ronald, like, don't ask a question, Ronald. <laughs> you always ask a question. Ronald's questions are always quite complicated. Yeah, uh, no, this one's simple. Uh, my question's for Xing. Oh. Uh, right, I mean, we first knew each other when you were a landscape architect and I was working on the project. Uh, yeah. And so, and you've been trained as both a landscape architect and an architect, right? How does landscape inform your practice, and do you still see yourself as a landscape architect? I don't know why I don't see myself as a landscape architect. Maybe I have this big chip on my shoulder, like, you know, architecture first, but because that's the first. Um, I mean, basically, I, I, I studied architecture, and midway through my core years, I decided to apply for landscape as well, just to you know, hedge my bets on, on like <laughs> my, my professional life later on. But, uh, but in, in all seriousness, it's because um, at the GSD, the architecture curriculum is pretty um, rigorous, kind of um, straight-jacketed. There's no sort of um, room for feeling and intuition and sort of looking at things from a more, um, you know, experiential narrative. I mean, at least certainly not the, the, the critics that I had, right? So I felt that, um, you know, I got into architecture because of joy, right? This idea about creating joy and all this sort of emotional, you know, experience. And then it was all kind of like um, beaten out of me in school. Whereas in the landscape department, everyone seemed a lot more um, free. They were more concerned about movement and experience and what do they see here and what do they see there and you know what is the unfolding of a journey. And um, I felt that that was a very important um, thing to remember. And in fact, um, it did help me as an architecture student because it reminded me of all those things. And I mean, it could just be m my own personal, you know, I mean, that it's, 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 true only for me, you know, that I had to do that, but I found that that really helped. So yes, I mean, the landscape architecture education was critical to um, my development as an architect. But um, I don't enjoy doing landscape architecture for other architects. Nothing personal, Ronald. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, you know, okay, so this is maybe how I can sneak in the one gender question. Uh -huh. of the evening, because I know neither of you probably want to talk about that subject very much. I, ha I have a lot to say about being a female architect. Okay. No, go Anything? ahead. Um, I, I remember when we were, when, so we worked together with, when Ronald was at Forum Architects on the, the Yale and U.S. campus, when which we th were the landscape architects. And I remember Fred Clark from um, Pelly's office basically saying, oh, I think 
um, our architecture is very masculine, and you guys need to you need to you know you need to feminize it. He said it's like a, it's like a yin yang thing. It's like you know you got to be the feminine side, and you have to add all of this. And it was really funny, honestly, that that kind of was a very accurate way of representing the relationship between the architect and the landscape architect. <laughs> I felt like we were like abused wives. Yes. At that time. Subservient. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't um, really a question. No, it wasn't no, really it was a question. It was a comment. Should I ask you a question? No, no, don't. No. <laughs> Is there another question from the audience? Oh, good. No. Uh, this question is directed to its uh, lacquer architects. Um, regarding the private cemetery, like it seems quite a uh, Western concept. Like the pavilions seem to have a European, uh, I don't know, uh, silhouette form. And uh, you talk about like the field being like kind of like open, like English like landscape. So this seems quite in contrast with like the traditional buildings over there. So is this like um, the intention, or like uh, do you try something else to resolve the conflict? Yeah, um, well, I didn't tell you the whole backstory about the client because he's very, actually, um, a modernist. Um, he's very into um, sort of contemporary Western buildings. He was a developer and um, also spent a lot of time in England, hence the, the, the way that that park was designed as a very much a sort of rolling English, um, I mean, with, with, with a lot of, contemporary insertions like those steel bridges, but um, there was definitely, um, it was very conscious that it would be a very contemporary um, sort of t take on it. And in terms of the Chinese architecture, I mean, there was a lot there already. We didn't show you pictures of it, but that courtyard um, building in the front, and there was another pavilion at the back called the Filial Piety Pavilion that had red columns and dragons going up. And I mean, it, it had enough um, of the, the sort of Chinese architecture uh, that um, existed. And what we wanted to do was to be very clear, to make a distinction from that, you know, what, what, we, what we added in. Is there another question perhaps that we can close with? Please. It's for uh, Lerka. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you tell me about your first project? How did you get it? And did you start the firm first and look for a job, or you get a job first and decide to start a firm? It depends what you call the first project, you know. Yeah. The bar. Yeah, we. I mean, because we went to school together, um, and. Um, we, we started doing a lot of little things together while at school. So we were um, given um, a simple restaurant interior, which was a, a bar and slash restaurant, and we designed that while in school. And maybe that, that we can call the first, the first project. Um, and it was quite fun because we designed it in Boston um, using Rhino. It's like the first time you ever opened the software, right? It was right? the first was edition like of in, Rhino, actually. It was like a 2000, 1999? 98. 1998. Uh, first edition Rhino. It was just all sort of hilariously, I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. And the main focus of the, of, of the, um, of the entire restaurant was a bar. And how we got it was, it was a bar opened by um, my mom and some of her friends. Simple as that, you know, <laughs> and then, and then um, yeah, we designed it, and then we got it built in Singapore by some um, boat manufacturers because we wanted it to be made out of fiberglass. And so we worked together with these guys who did boat hulls out of fiberglass. Um, and I had just had surgery on my legs, so I was hopping around on crutches, talking to these guys, and feeling very scared because it was the first time that we were dealing with construction. So yeah, it was. I wouldn't say that led on to other things. It just led on to us working together. Yeah. You know? It was, we kind of wound up working together by accident. I think <laughs> because my parents worked together and then when we talked about like how we're going to do our career, how we're going to plan it, it seemed like a terrible idea to work together. And we're like, well, no, we won't do that. And then I think after that project, then it became almost easy. by default yeah. easy. So I think that was the inception. How did you get your first project?
how did we get our first project? And what was it? Yeah. It was just a bungalow. Just and, uh, a bungalow. Yeah, it was a, it was <laughs> a bungalow. And I figured um, the bungalow fee will pay my salary for possibly one year. And that's when I uh, started come out on my own and start doing the house. And um, yeah, one thing looks at another. Now a bungalow is a dream job, by the way. <laughs> Can I ask what year that was? What year was that that you started with? Okay. Well, while we were designing the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other burning questions for any, anyone? Okay, well then I think on that note, um, just please join me in thanking our guests for tonight, Christina and Sheng. All right.